well, well, look who it is. He is back, beard and all, even though supposedly he's had it for a while. Um, I'm pleased to be here today with someone who's been on the show a number of times. I believe the last time was a debate. Actually, no, the last time was a debate with me, with yours truly. Yeah. Uh, that was right or after Edward the, the last. Yeah, that was the last Dave Smith debate. But of course, he is now running for office again for Maine State Senate. Please to welcome back Eric Brakey. Eric, are you ready to roar? I'm ready to roar, Mark. And my only regret is that my Lions of Liberty coffee mug is still in Texas. Oh, no, that's too bad. Are you going to be able to get it back? What happened? Is it, is it being held hostage somewhere? Uh, I, my wife's got it. <laughs> okay, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah, let, I kind of, well, before we even get into anything else, I think really, now that I thought of it again, I, I think the first question to ask is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you feel? I know it's been a while, but how do you feel coming off that debate with me um, about Edward Snowden? Now, I will, I will admit, all the polls I posted, Twitter, I think a Patreon poll, you did win that debate, but it was, it was close. I, I had more support than I might have thought I would get. I was getting in the 30s to 40s, so I don't feel like I, I got trounced. I, you know, I think Ed, Edward Snowden being generally regarded as a as a hero in the libertarian movement, I think that you were taking the much tougher position, uh, a, a contrarian position. And, uh, you know, I commend you for that, that sometimes we need people to, to question the things that uh, we take for granted. Yeah. I don't even know where I actually fall in it. I just went as hard into that as I as I could because, hey, it, it's a showdown, you know. But yeah, but, no, that was a fun, fun debate. It was fun doing the debate with Dave. I, um, I still hear about that one all the time. Whenever I kind of end up in a circle of libertarians, people tell me, oh yeah, that, that debate with Dave Smith. Uh, so yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate you, uh, uh, being the, 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 the debate moderator for the Liberty movement. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, it's glad to, glad to be back on the show with you. Yeah, for sure. And um, so why don't we start by just talking about, I, th I think the last time we just did a one-on-one, -on -one, at least on uh, on this program, you were running for Congress. That was a couple of years ago. And Dave actually brought mm -hmm. this up in the debate, how you kind of got railroaded. I, I think the neocons were, were involved. There was some chicanery there or a, a campaign against you anyway. Can you kind of get into a little bit more of what happened there? Yeah. So this was 2020. I just come off of, you know, I'd served two terms in the state Senate. I had been the Republican nominee in the state for U.S. Senate. So I had a lot of support, uh, you know, especially coming off of accomplishments like constitutional carry uh, during my, my time in legislative office. So I had a lot of support with the party. I went into this race for the second district of Maine, which is um, it, it, it's kind of the red half of the state of, of, of Maine. A Maine, you might think of Maine as a blue state or a purple state, but the second district is northern Maine, where it's like frontier attitude. It's like geographically the biggest district east of the Mississippi, a uh, very rural. Uh, people love their guns and they want the government to leave them alone. So kind of natural libertarians uh, in, in, to a certain degree. Um, and yeah, I went into that race with, it was, you know, a strong campaign with strong messaging, uh, strong built in support. Uh, and. Then, um, yeah, as a couple of things kind of went haywire towards the end, I mean, first of all, COVID hit, uh, and then the election date was moved. Like, you know, try planning for uh, try planning for uh, an election when they can just the the Democrat governor can just arbitrarily change the election date. Uh, so it was pushed out for an extra month, which kind of gave some of the neoconservative forces in the Washington D.C. establishment enough time to realize that they were in trouble. Uh, in this race, that they were going to get a uh, a Ron Pauler, another Ron Pauler in Congress. I think the exact words from um, from um, uh, Kevin McCarthy as he was yelling at someone at the Club for Growth. Club for Growth was backing me in that race. He was yelling at them, saying, "This guy's going to be another Justin Amash or Thomas Massey. What are you thinking? Like <laughs> supporting this guy?" So well, yeah, certain... we know that's why <laughs> that's why people are supporting you. <laughs> So it was a certain kind of, I guess, backhanded compliment there. Um, yeah. But but yeah, the, like, the establishment. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I like being compared to those guys. There, you know that. I, anyway, um, but we we were in a solid position. But kind of in the last few weeks, we saw this. Um, both one of my opponents kind of went on like a kamikaze campaign, smear campaign against me with uh, in in TV. That kind of hurt me a little bit. Um, what were you? Were you, you racist? Were you uh, sexist, misogynist? Where, where do we go with here? No, I was being called a never Trumper, um, which I've always considered myself a sometimes Trumper. 
Uh, you know, it's like I get attacked by the never Trumpers for being too pro Trump. And I get uh, I get attacked by the I get attacked by people with TDS on both sides for like not right. being right on the Trump issue. And I just like I'm for liberty and I'll be with him whenever he's for it. I'll be against him whenever he's against it. You know, so what what have you? Um, so I got attacked for being a never Trumper. My old Vita Coco commercial where from when I was a professional actor, you know about this Vita Coco commercial, Mark, do you? I don't think I've seen this. No. <laughs> All right. I, well, I, maybe will I don't be... bring it up very often. It has. Should it I pull has... it up right now? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I will definitely look it up after this interview. So, and I'll so, post it in the show notes so everyone will see it. Um. Well, <laughs> when I was before I was in politics, when I was a professional actor working in New York City, I did a co uh, commercial for Vita Coco Coconut Water, which happened to feature men dancing in Brazilian speedos. Uh, you know, <laughs> to uh, <laughs> drink a coconut water, having a fun. Not time. at school, I imagine. Right? Just, this is a no, normal no, no. setting for that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it looks weird when you kind of take a little clip of it out of context, as I've certainly found. But if you see the whole like. 60 second commercial altogether. It's a fun, family friendly commercial. Anyway, my opponent took that little clip of it out of context, <laughs> ran TV ads against me. Oh, Eric wow. Brake, he's a clown. Look at him dancing in a Speedo. And he's, and he wants to burn Trump stuff or something or another. Anyway, that hurt me a little bit. But what really hurt was in the final kind of stretch, we kind of out of nowhere, um, a super PAC emerged um, that spent about a half a million dollars against me. In the final weeks, mostly on TV ads and mailers, uh, saying I was peas in a pod with Alexandria Casio Cortez, and uh, and basically saying I was an ever Trumper. This was the line that they kept using against me, uh, because basically for things I had said when I was supporting Senator Rand Paul in the primary against him when the debates were so hot and heavy, because um, I was Rand's campaign chair for the state. Right. Um. So yeah, that got dropped on me, and um. Yeah, it, it it sunk us. The woman who was running a kamikaze campaign against me um, didn't win. I slipped from first place. And kind of the guy, the establishment candidate who nobody had really been paying much attention to because he'd been polling in third place the entire time, he kind of kind of came right through the middle and uh, won the nomination and then went on to lose uh, in the general election in a district that Trump carried. So it was a big pickup wow. opportunity for the Republicans, but it was clear that they would rather lose with someone they could control than win with someone that they could not. And I've actually tried to kind of over the years, just, you know, I'm not dwelling on it. I've moved on with my life, but it was curious to try to figure out where this money came from, what the super PAC was, because their big donor was, they were 501c4 organizations that don't have to disclose their donors, which, Hey, fine by me, free speech. I'm not one of these people saying that they need to disclose everything. But it was interesting to find out that the 501c3 organizations, one was affiliated with Kevin McCarthy, the, the Republican uh, oh. leader. Um, one was affiliated with Mike Pence. Uh, and oh. one was the Republican Jewish coalition, which I guess they just don't like that I'm for getting out of the wars in the Middle East. So that was uh, yeah, that, well, was that means where you're anti-Semitic too. So yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, wow. So yeah, it's, it's all, all the forces, uh, <laughs> all from your own party, basically, <laughs> seemingly for the most part. Well, I don't think they've ever forgiven me for um, how we stood up to them at the national convention in 2012 uh, in the showdown between Ron Paul and Mitt Romney when they kicked me out of that convention as a national delegate. So, yeah, I don't think the Republican establishment on the national level, level has ever forgiven me for that. I think the establishment in my own state has, uh, you know, on the state level in Maine has mostly realized that they kind of need me. And so they've made peace with me. Uh, they certainly wanted me to run for state Senate again because no Republicans been able to win this seat ever since I left it. Uh, but uh, but, you know, long story short of it all, the, the conclusion I've come to after two federal campaigns for office is a realization that the federal government, these seats in Congress are so heavily guarded. It's a very heavily, you know, heavily fortified citadel of corruption there. And it is very easy for them to stop. Uh, individuals who try to run for those large federal seats um, and, and make a difference there. But they can't stop us on the state level. And I think this is the Achilles heel of the whole system of corruption is we've got to get liberty loving principled people into the state legislatures across this country, use the principles of nullification to uh, defund this out of control federal government and to stop the enforcement of their unconstitutional laws and mandates. So we can do that if we get good people in on the state level. I'm very encouraged seeing more and more good people running 
uh, every election cycle and getting elected. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm focusing my energy is taking back my old state Senate seat and, uh, and taking the fight for liberty into uh, in, in a, I think we can win this in a decentralized fashion through the state. So that's where I'm taking my fight. Uh, a lot of people in our circles anyway, you know, depending on what side of that debate between you and Dave uh, they were on, might hear your tale and say, well, you know, that's why we can't do this Republican Party thing, because they're just trying to railroad you if you get to any level of power. Um, and maybe in a way you answered answered the question already in the sense of, of well, that's why you're focusing on the state level. Uh, but do you see, I mean, what is your response to, to libertarians who would say, like, you're, you're just not going to make any headway with the Republican Party if you want to do anything, at least in your, maybe even admittedly above the state level, it's just never going to happen because they're they're not open to people like you at that level. Well, I don't. I don't think anything good is ever going to happen on the federal level, whether it's through the Libertarian Party or the Republican Party. It, it's, it's the the incentive structure of the whole system are all wrong. Uh, it's going to have to come from the states and from the bottom up people standing up there. And what I would say to my Libertarian Party friends, and I will say, I actually I found out since the debate with Dave that I could in fact join the Libertarian Party and 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 also be a registered Republican. Mm -hmm. I thought it was mutually exclusive. So I signed up for my local main libertarian party. All I had to do was sign the kind of the non-aggression pledge, which I agree uh, agree with the non-aggression principle. Uh, and so I've kind of got dual citizenship now, though, of course, I'm running as a Republican. Uh, I think that is the most effective vehicle for getting elected if that's your goal. Um, and I do you have think that will be used against you in a future like, oh, this guy, we found out he's he signed up as a libertarian. And, you know, <laughs> that means he probably believes in drag shows and all this. Are you, are you concerned about that being used against you? I don't know. Let them try. Yeah, I mean, what what <laughs> is to be concerned? I, what you should I, do I, is I, get ahead of it. You should actually use that that Vita Coco ad is in your own <laughs> ad campaign so they can't even come after you. That's what I would do. I've, but I'm not your I've already, I've already done a few uh, funny response videos over the years. But um. As far as, uh, you know, in politics, if if they can't find something on you, they'll make something up about you. So you might as well just stand up for what you believe in. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I joined the Libertarian Party as a, I guess uh, they've got like two tiers of membership. So I'm like bottom tier of membership because uh, I'm not a registered libertarian, um, mostly just because there's a lot of friends there and a lot of good people, I think, who mean well. And I'd like to be in on the conversation with them. But I ultimately want to make practical change in terms of getting my own state, the state of Maine, you know, back on track economically and in terms of protecting and restoring the freedoms that we've lost over the last couple of years. And I could be on the outside throwing stones for a long time as, you know, if I was just a Libertarian Party candidate who um, b was never going to be able to break through kind of the two-party duopoly because of the way the rules are, are written. Uh, or I could run it, as a Republican, start with a base of 30% of the vote and go out and knock doors and uh, and win the rest of the votes that I need. So it's a it's a better it's just a better vehicle all around um, if your goal is to win elections. Yeah, I think that speaks to it right there. It really just depends on your goal. If your goal is literal political change in terms of affecting legislation and this sort of thing, uh, then I, I don't see how anyone could argue for the Libertarian Party or for the third party. The only good argument for it is if you want to be unrestrained from you know having to do those normal political things and you want to be the the purest voice possible for it but i guess that begs the question you know where does that leave us politically but we don't need to get into all that i've i've talked about it uh, way too much over the last uh, few months and uh, i think it's it is where it is at this point but i, I kind of want to circle back to what the last few years were like for you um particularly i, I don't know how long you remain i know you ended, were in texas as well with y'all so but what how was maine specifically during the COVID stuff, how did they react uh, legislatively? That's a state I'm, I really haven't hadn't heard much about. Maybe maybe for good reason. Hopefully, yeah, it's been pretty bad in Maine. Um, sadly, you know, when I was in the state senate, we had a Republican governor who is no libertarian by any stretch, but um, came out of the Tea Party movement. His name was Paula Page, and uh, he was pretty good uh, comparatively. If you compared him to other governors across the country, he was one of the best governors. Uh, on a lot of issues we care about. Uh, I don't believe he would ever have um, done what our Democrat governor did when she was in power uh, these last couple of years, which is locking down the state, driving people out of business, uh, firing healthcare workers from their jobs, including those with natural immunity, because they didn't want to get a, a vaccine that was medically not necessary for them. 
Uh, and in fact, it, boy, numbers just came out recently of kind of economic growth numbers. And right next door to us, New Hampshire is growing economically according to their GDP. And uh, we just got news that our economy shrank over the course of the last year. Uh, so uh, it's, yeah, when you when you treat the economy like just something you can flip on and off like a light switch and not recognize the harm that you're doing to uh, the capital structure and the harm that you're doing to, you know, just people trying to, to make a living and to get by. Um, yeah, it's been it's been hard. Now, the sad thing is that there's a lot of people who still believe that it was necessary that believe that somehow all of these policies that we went through, that that we were put through by a governor uh, acting in a dictatorial fashion without even, you know, these weren't laws passed by the legislature. This was just mandate decrees. Um, a lot of people still believe it was necessary and that it somehow saved lives. But of course, you and I know, and I'm sure most of your audience must know, that there's, there's no evidence backing that up. You do a state-by-state -state comparison on lockdown states versus non-lockdown states in terms of COVID rates and COVID fatalities. And there is no correlation whatsoever between uh, between these rates and those policies. And as Tom Woods always says, if it really was necessary, if it really was necessary to do such draconian policies to destroy people's lives in, in this fashion over the course of such a long period of time, you would expect the 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 uh, COVID rates and COVID fatality rates, you would expect the differences to be profound, you to morally justify this. You would expect to be able to look at a look at Florida and look at South Dakota and compare it to states like Maine and California and these other states, and you should be able to say, "Wow, you know, uh, it's 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 so clear. Look at how many people were dying in these states that didn't do these policies versus the smart states like California." And it's just not the case. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that there is a degree of Stockholm syndrome and uh, there's a degree of people just wanting to believe that, you know, with everything that they were forced to sacrifice, they, people want to believe that it was for a purpose, that it served a purpose. It's kind of like in, was it World War One or World War Two when, uh, people were, had, had, were melting down their, like, relics in their churches in order to donate metal to the war effort. And that metal was never really used for anything. It was just, you know, a propaganda campaign to make people feel invested in the larger fight. Uh, it's kind of like what we went through with COVID. People were forced to sacrifice. Those sacrifices did not help anything, but people want to believe that it did because otherwise you'd just be angry at the world. Why, why, why did they make us do this? And frankly, I do think we need to ask that question. Why did they put us through all of this? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to send you off on, on too much of a a rabbit hole, I guess. But uh, do you have thoughts on why they put us all through this? It, even if when I it's I don't think they're that stupid at every level. I mean, at some point, the evidence becomes so clear that you that even people who mean well have to would have to if they if they did mean well would have to be relooking at things. But clearly, in a lot of areas, especially, I mean, Los Angeles is about to institute another mass mandate. Uh, I mean, the, the stuff is is still there and coming back. So what do you think is behind it, if not, you know, the purity of, of all of our health? I think, well, uh, obviously there's politicians who just enjoy the power. They enjoy wielding power over people and it's intoxicating. So there's that. But I think there's also a bit of degree of like otherwise good people who kind of started down this path and not being able to admit to themselves that they were wrong. It's a hard thing to admit that you were wrong, especially if something of such significance. I mean, I remember how difficult it was for me when I was younger and a cheerleader for like the war in Iraq uh, and George W. Bush and thinking how great it was. And, you know, and I was just like a teenager who had no impact on policy whatsoever. And it was very hard for me to admit that I was wrong, even though my opinions really had, had no impact on anything. Imagine you are the decision maker and you made the decision to shut down the economy. It led to the devastation of so many lives. Um, and how hard it must be to, to admit to yourself that that was, that you made the wrong call and people suffered for it. You got to, you got to find ways to rationalize it for yourself or otherwise you realize that you might be a terrible human being. Um, and so yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a part of it too. People just don't want to admit it. Um, and so the policymakers, I think we caught into this thing. It's like once we accepted the basic premise that these kind of 
policies were necessary and helpful, which they weren't, uh, if you did not accept the fact that it wasn't helpful, all you could do was continue to double down when they when they didn't work. It's like the same thing with like the gun control debate. It's like every time they propose a gun control measure and it doesn't work to stop gun violence. In fact, oftentimes it makes it worse because less law abiding citizens are able to defend themselves rather than going back and reexamining. Maybe this whole the premise of this is flawed. They just have to keep doubling down and pushing for more gun control and more gun control, and more gun control. It's always that we haven't cracked down hard enough. And that's why the policy is not working. What has been your sense kind of on the ground in your district? Are you getting more of that sense of what you described of people believing it, thinking it's, you know, doubling down and, and really begging for that stuff? Or are is there a, at this point a healthy dose of skepticism? And, and I'm, I'm curious, too, if there's going to be at least some portion of the people that in your district yeah. that you're that you're trying to win over that are going to be in that more we're doubling down. We believe this whole thing is exactly how it was laid out to us. So what are, what is your strategy about how to, how to speak to those people who might see you like a maniac for not wanting to strap masks on five-year-olds and inject everyone you see with, with whatever. Well, I do think that in, in Maine at very least, except for on like the fringes, most people have moved on from this and don't want to go back. Even if they think it was necessary at the time, it's it's like our, people have moved on. And so frankly, when I go door to door and talk to people, because that's that's how I, I, I do it. I go door to door. I've knocked on over a thousand doors so far and just talk to voters about what they're concerned about. Some people bring up everything that we went through in COVID the last couple of years and how crazy it was or necessary it was, whatever their opinion is. But most people are concerned with like the problem right now, which is the fact that inflation is hitting 10%. Uh, they're losing their savings. They're losing their, their, the value of their savings and retirements are diminishing. People on fixed incomes don't know what they're going to do uh, to to get through this time. And so, you know, you and I know that that's a direct consequence of all the policies they put us through the last two years, shutting down the economy, disrupting supply chains, and then, of course, printing trillions of dollars out of thin air and hand, and throwing it out of helicopters. Like that's, uh, of course, you know, it's a consequence of that. Uh, so I find myself as I go door to door, you know, not rehashing so much um, the the past and, you know, but talking about how we can address kind of the problems we're facing right now. Though I will say when I when I get into the main Senate, I very much do want to address uh, what happened uh, and put some laws in place to stop it from happening again. Things like at very least. If we're ever going to, you know, imbue a governor with these dictatorial emergency powers ever again, it should have a we should have in the law that there is a mandatory like sunset on that, that it has to be renewed on a regular basis. Because what happened in Maine, and I think this is what happened in, in most states when they were just telling, oh, it's just 15 days to slow the spread. So the legislature voted to give our governor, you know, emergency powers, but they didn't put an expiration date on it. And so she got to milk it for over a year. So uh, and when Republicans realized how much they'd screwed up, uh, they called for the legislature to come back in. And Democrats were like, no, nah, we kind of like it this way. We kind of like not having to take any tough it's an emergency. Letting... Remember? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an emergency that lasts for over a year. Um, so, yeah, I, I, there, there's some reform that needs to happen. But as I go door to door and talk to voters, I've got to talk to them about the issues that you know they care about right now. Uh, and, and, you know, and thankfully as a, as a Ron Paul libertarian, there's a lot to say about inflation and how we can uh, get it under control, what we can do from the state level, uh, how we can protect people from it. And of course, understanding why in the world it's happening in the first place. For sure. Um, I'll, and I do want to talk about that a little bit more, but I want to just go back since you were talking about, you know, how states can sort of put some laws in place to prevent, uh, this yeah. kind of COVID tyranny from coming back. I'm curious to your opinions on, um, the kind of law passed in Florida, which might really, if if you look down the little, the middle, looking for that purity, uh, might not pass that libertarian purity test. Uh, there's one recent law that prevents uh, employers from uh, requiring COVID vaccines, um, which certainly in a bubble, if we had never heard of the last two years, you might think, well, they should, the state shouldn't be getting involved in that. The state shouldn't say such a thing to a private business. I'm curious. What would be your opinion on a law like that? Would you favor a law like that in Maine? Or would, does that kind of rub against the liberty a little too much, I guess? You know, it gives me um, it gives me a lot of heartburn, uh, that that <laughs> that kind of a law. Um, is, it is a difficult decision. And I think the 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 answer to that question really rests upon what kind of um, 
what kind of federal power is being put upon businesses to, per, you know, to make a particular decision with things like vaccine mandates? Um, I, I believe in using state power to fight back against federal power. I don't believe in using state power to try to control what regular people, the decisions they make in their own lives and their own businesses. I want to leave that. I want to leave them be. But if they are being put upon by the federal government and coerced into making particular decisions that are, um, uh, yeah, then then that's a form of tyranny and oppression and it's inappropriate to use state power against it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it really it really kind of boils down to, um, you know, it really kind of boils down to that. I think a better I think. A, a, but, um, you know kind of pushing back in the way that they did in Florida, I think is kind of a, at best a Band-Aid. I think we need to really get at the root of the problem, which is this system where government steals our money and ransoms it back to us with strings attached from the federal level. Um, you know, this is how, I mean, we saw this in like healthcare settings, right? Uh, uh, the Biden administration said, if if hospitals and doctor's offices do not have uh, vaccine mandates on their staff, even though the vaccines did not stop the spread uh, or transmission of COVID and were purely for uh, purely benefited the individual, not, not, there was no public health benefit to it. Um, he said, if you don't do this, we're cutting off your Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid funds. Uh, you know, and I think that just should kind of reinforce just how controlled our healthcare system is by Washington DC through the purse. Uh, we have let kind of them kind of, take over, um, control so much of the funding that goes into our healthcare system. And at the end of the day, it's our money they took from us and they're using against us. So, uh, you know, I think that we need to look at, and I recently spoke at the Porcupine Freedom Festival in New Hampshire about this idea. I think that we need to look at states um, resurrecting an idea called tax nullification, where the states assert their constitutional role as the parties in the con uh, in the compact that is the constitution um, to uh, to review the federal budget and only send to Congress those tax uh, a a proportion of the tax dollars that are being appropriated for constitutional purposes. So basically, like uh, if you had a bunch of different states say we're going to interpose ourselves between our taxpayers and the IRS, we will collect the federal taxes and we will hold on to them until we get to review the budget. And then if 60% of what you're spending on is constitutional, and of course that's being generous, you and I know it's a lot less than 60%, but let's say if we find 60% to be constitutional, we'll send you 60% of the money. And then when uh, Washington DC, they stomp their feet and say, you can't do that. We're going to withhold your federal funds and say, well, go ahead because we've got the federal funds and we'll supplant whatever federal highway funds you're threatening to take away from us. We'll supplant it with the funds that we're holding on to and we didn't send you. Do you mean that like the state of Maine with a state? Because that this is what I'm kind of spinning my head around is like, what about the fact that all these companies like you could like the state of Maine could say something. But what if you have all these major corporations in Maine and they're like, well, you know, the federal government is who takes the taxes out of out of our these paychecks. So, you know, we're 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 still connected to them. We don't care what what Maine is doing or would Maine find some way to like be the ones to collect those taxes from those companies. Like I'm just kind of trying to envision how that might play out because I, I love it in concept. I'm trying to, you know, craft yeah, my, craft wrap my head around how it would work out in reality. I think states would have to assert that if you're doing business in Maine or you're earning income in Maine or whatever state that you're going to pay your assessed federal taxes to us and we, and we will uh, then then send it on to the IRS after this review of the budget. And I will say it is a pretty um, perhaps dramatic thing to do. Uh, some people might say, how could you do that? And wouldn't they just crush you if you were a single state doing this, especially a small state like Maine? The federal government would come come against you pretty hard. I agree, which is why I think that we need to, uh, with all these liberty legislators we're getting elected across the country, um, we should look at things like trigger clauses on on bills like these. We should sponsor them and pass them in multiple states and say, this will go into effect when X number of states have passed similar laws. because. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one small state standing alone, like a, a free easy. state project pledge in, in a way, like once once everyone signs up for this, then we have the, <laughs> the strength to move forward. Right. Once 13 states pass tax nullification laws, we all do it together and tell Washington, D.C., we're, we're collecting the funds. We're holding on to it and we'll send it to you when we're satisfied that the purposes you are seeking to spend them on 
are uh, are authorized under the Constitution, under Article One, Section Eight. What do you tell people going back to the, the inflation thing, which is probably you know we can we can have all the theories about what our problems about politics may be or may not, but at the end of the day, when people go to the gas pump and that gas is double what it was a year ago and foods double what it was a year ago, I mean that's what matters to most people. But what do you actually tell people? Because I think our our libertarian instinct is to just hand the men the Fed and go on a rant about the Federal Reserve, but but that doesn't really fix the problem in the short term for anybody. So what do you tell people yeah. that you can do as someone who's running for state Senate? What do you tell people that you can do on a state level to try to help them? With yeah. I mean, I do do that a little bit. I tell them we've got to demand oh, an audit of the hard Federal to resist. Reserve. I mean, <laughs> we are who we are. <laughs> uh, so I, I break it down into kind of, as far as like policy things we can do on the state level, I break it down into three buckets. The first bucket is what can we do immediately to bring down the cost of living for main people. Um, and these are what I would call band-aid solutions. They're the things we're going to do right now. This is not the long-term fix, but these are things we can do right now to, to provide some relief. So things like suspending taxes on basic necessities, like the gas tax, like in Maine, you know, when I go door to door and I talk about the gas prices, people are like saying, yeah, the gas prices are ba bad, but boy, if it's like this, when winter comes around, heating oil is going to just be, uh, is going to, is going to drive people bankrupt. Uh, that's a big thing. It gets pretty cold up here in Maine and people people need to be able to afford heating oil um, in a lot in a lot of a lot of houses. So suspending suspending these taxes on some of these basic necessities um, until inflation, in, let's say, like the CPI is below four percent. We suspend it until CPI is below four. Um, uh, um, I'd also like to anyway, there's various things we can do. I've, I'm also talking about you know, giving a tax credit for turnpike tolls and other things, just things that where places where the government is nickel and diming us on things that r people need. Um, let's suspend those taxes until inflation's under control. So that's first bucket, immediate relief. Now, this, the second and third buckets are just understanding what inflation is. If inflation is too, uh, too much money chasing too few goods and services, then we've got two supply problems we need to address, the supply of money and the supply of goods and services. So on the supply of money, you know, there is, there, that's hard to tackle from the state level because it's coming from the federal government, it's coming from the Federal Reserve. We could pass a resolution of the state legislature demanding our federal delegation support and audit of the Federal Reserve. I think that's something we could do. It doesn't have a lot of teeth, but it's, it's, something we could do. And if state legislatures were to start passing that across the country, that would put pressure on Congress to start uh, to to, uh, to um, take that, that, that more seriously. Uh, so that would be a good thing. Um, we could also look at things like, you know, I, I go door to door and some people bring up and I, I'm starting to think, you know, maybe it's not so crazy an idea. Like maybe we should start our own state bank and maybe we should start issuing our own currency, which is backed by gold and silver. Um, but then you'd that... be a statist, Eric, literally. <laughs> well, I'm all for using state power to combat federal power, just not using state power to go against the people. So, um, yeah, uh, so that's something that's something we could do. That sounds a little radical to some people, but um, but the Constitution says we can do it. Constitution says the states can only coin you know, money that's gold and silver. So maybe let's start coining money that's gold and silver give people something that is time tested a hedge against inflation uh that that could be used in our own local economy um so that's something we could do um that's kind of a big idea uh that's not something that's going to be implemented overnight uh so but those are things we could do on the 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 supply of money issue uh the supply of goods and services that's something we can more directly affect on the state level uh so you know one thing here in Maine with energy prices being so high um you know, our gas is about five bucks a gallon right now. Um, it used to be my normal gas price in California. So it's, like, <laughs> it's kind of funny to watch people amazed at, at what I just was no big deal before. But in California, it's, it's insane. insane. I always said that the Democrats were going to turn Maine into California. And uh, it seems to be what they're doing. Um, thankfully, uh, you know, we don't have the San Francisco problems yet of people defecating in the streets. But I wonder how far away we are from that. Yeah. Um so, uh, you know, we need to develop domestic energy. I mean, there was a big effort to get natural gas pipeline up to Maine. Uh, Massachusetts stood in the way. They didn't want a natural gas pipeline coming through their state. I think that's something that needs to be revisited. That's kind of more niche local, local stuff that maybe your audience may or may not be interested in. Uh, but one particular thing we can do on a state level, and this is something I think that could be done in every single state, is I don't know what's going on in your state, but we're dealing with a workforce shortage. 
of there's a lot of just there are so many jobs that are out there available to be filled, but people are not applying for those jobs. Um, and one of the things that was put in place when I was in the Senate in the past uh, by our Republican governor, Paula Page, was uh, work requirements on welfare benefits for able-bodied adults without kids. So basically, if you're between the age of 18 and like 50 and you don't have children to take care of, uh, and you're on, let's say, the food stamp program for more than three months. So not just kind of a temporary, you know, I just need a little bit of a helping hand to get up on my feet again, but you're on this for an extended period of time. There was a requirement that to stay enrolled in the program, you needed to be working or volunteering or doing some kind of jo job training, something to get you off the sofa, back into the labor force and, and on your own two feet. Now, this is important for two reasons. One, Extended welfare dependency for people who are capable of so much more, that's not helping them. That's not a happy life. That's thats not how you find satisfaction and fulfillment in life. And sometimes we got to look at the difference between helping people and enabling them. So sometimes people need a little bit of a push, especially after everything we've been through the last two uh, few years where people are, are continue to be paid to stay home and not work. Um, uh, and then, of course, it would help address the workforce shortage because I mean, I hear it from employers all the time. They're competing with the welfare roles. Uh, government is paying so much for people not to work. So why would people work? So that was a, a, a welfare reform policy that was put in place uh, during the last administration. And within the first 30 days of our Democrat governor coming into office, she wiped it off the books. So uh, able-bodied adults without kids can get welfare now for as long as they want. And there's no expectation that they need to be trying to get a job uh, and get out there, develop their skills and get back into the workforce. And so a lot of people are just kind of stuck in this place of arrested development. That's not good for them. And it's not good for our economy. What what actually led to you running this current campaign? Were you planning this basically for all the last two years, like kind of in the back of your mind? Or was there, you know, while you were doing being a spokesman for Yal and doing other things? Or were you did something else like prompt you to say, you know what, I'm going to go back to that seat. That's where they need me. That's where I can be the most useful. You know, um, it, it was a long kind of decision making process. I mean, truth be told, there was a part of me that after my congressional campaign ended and and it was brutal. I mean, it, it, it took a personal toll on me, to be honest. It took a toll on me and, and my and my uh, and my family. Um, but. You know, I kind of think at least for the time being, I've sworn off. I swore off kind of doing a federal race ever, ever again. I mean, we'll see. The, the, ever is just because it's time, that much more brutal in terms of how they go after you. It's that much more brutal. Um, and boy, it's it's exhaust. I mean, it's exhausting. Like, so when you're running on a, a race on that level, like you just got to sit on the phones and raise money. Like, that's what you're doing day in and day out. Just calling, dialing for dollars, raising money because, uh, you know, what I love about Maine and what I love about like the small legislative districts we have here is that I can go out there and I can knock on every door in the district. I can meet with people face to face. If I try to do that in a congressional race, you know, you um, I could go out and knock doors every single day. I'm not going to hit a fraction of uh, of 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 the district. It's going to make a marginal impact. But I can go out and knock thousands of doors in my state Senate district, and it makes a big impact because it's a much smaller population. Ironically, I, I think the size of a Senate district in Maine is about the size of what a congressional district was originally supposed to be, about 60,000 people. Uh, so, you know, the founders kind of, I think, believed early on that as if districts got so big in terms of population, now we're looking at districts are like, you know, uh, something like, you know, um, 750,000 people in a district. How, how do you get, you, can, you can't know everyone in, in your district that large. It, it's not really a representative system anymore. Um, so I like that I can get out and meet with people one-on-one. -on -one and, and I also think that as a state Senator, you have a lot more power than you might realize if you know how to use it to combat the federal government. Uh, than you might even have in Congress, because right now, I mean, Justin Amash complains about it all the time in Congress. It's like you sit there, the bill, there's the committee process has become a joke. The amendment process has become a joke. You basically just get to vote up, up or down, yes or no, on bills crafted behind closed doors by leadership uh, and dropped on your desk with you know less than 12 hours before the vote. So uh, Congress has become a joke. Uh, in some ways, I kind of look at it and think, well, it would have been nice to have the bully pulpit of being a member of Congress and be able to spread the ideas of liberty like Ron 
and 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 Massey and Justin Amash have done. Um, I look back on it and I think, you know, from the state Senate, I was able to pass constitutional carry, and that became a that's been a domino effect across the country. We, Maine was the sixth state with constitutional carry. Now we're up to 25, and Maine was kind of that's a key crazy. domino in that effort. Um, uh, I was able to get welfare reform, pass right to try, uh, rewrite our medical cannabis laws. So now we've got one of the most pro-free market uh, uh, cannabis industries in the country. If you like, if you like cannabis, whether it's medical or adult use cannabis, Maine is really one of the most free states for that. And I got to play a great role in, in basically leading the process on overhauling completely our medical cannabis laws. Um, so those are things I could do in the state legislature. Uh, you know, in Congress, like even if people agree that like, you know, cannabis should be uh, descheduled, like nobody can get anything done there. So change is going to happen from the bottom up. Tell us a little bit more about the campaign itself. Are you, I mean, obviously, you know, we get cocky here. It's your old seat. Do you see yourself? Do, do Are people kind of embracing you as, oh, Eric's back? And, and are, do you think you're going to be kind of welcome right back in? Or are you facing any any challenges uh, within the party? I mean, how, how's it all shaping up for you? Well, I did have one guy who tried to primary me, but he didn't get the signatures he needed to get on the ballot. So I coasted through the primary with no opposition. Um, but the fight was always going to be the general election. Um. This district is currently held by a Democrat. Um, he has he he's decided not to run again. I thought the timing was interesting. He announced he wasn't running again when I announced that I was running. Yeah. So maybe a good I've sign. also heard <laughs> maybe, see you. Yeah. maybe he didn't want to run against me. I also heard maybe he had a health some health concerns. So maybe there may have been some other Coco, Vita Coco there. guy. No way. I'm not messing with that. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, I did win this district twice with about 60 percent of the vote. And that was pretty much a high watermark for Republicans in this district. Uh, nobody had won this district uh, on the Republican side as as big as I had uh, both my times there since Olympia Snow, who uh, held this state Senate district district in the past, and of course, went on to be our U.S. senator um, um, in the past. So and that was like in 1988, the year I was born. So, yeah, I, you know, I campaign very hard. I get out and I connect with people. I was a little nervous when I was getting out to knock doors because it has been like six years since I've knocked on these doors. But I, um, uh, you know, but as I go door to door, it has been, I mean, the encouragement and support has been amazing. I, I'm sometimes surprised just like when I knock on a door and before I like open my mouth to introduce myself, they're like, you're Eric Brakey. We've seen you on TV. We're supporting you 100%. Put up a yard sign. It's like, all right, well, that was easy. Um, but but that's not every house, of course. You know, uh, some people, uh, but I guess I, I have built up a lot of name recognition in, in the area at very least. But it is going to be a fight. This district is the bellwether for the whole state. Uh, this district, which is the uh, Senate seat, if for folks who know Maine, uh, it's Aub uh, Auburn is the the biggest city in the district. It's like the third biggest city in Maine. It represents about 55% of the vote uh, in the district. And then I've got some smaller rural towns that are also in the district, New Gloucester, Poland, and Durham. This district is the bellwether. It has predicted the Senate majority in every election for the last 14 years. So whenever Democrats have had the majority, it's been with this Senate seat. Whenever Republicans have had the majority, it's been with this Senate seat. So kind of a lot's riding on it, um, but no I'm kind of getting... <laughs> you know, I work best under pressure. Uh, but but yeah, uh, so I'm just getting out there. It's been the support has been encouraging. I do have an opponent who is also working very hard. We've crossed paths. She's out there knocking doors. I'm knocking doors. But I think we have clear records. Um, you ever you know, awkwardly walk up the, the same driveway at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> we came close. <laughs> we came close one day. Uh, but um, but yeah, no, it's uh, I, I you know. At the end of the day, you know, win or lose, and I intend to win, but win or lose, there's certain things you can't control. And you just want to know at the end of the day that you left it all on the table. You didn't leave anything undone. Uh, so, and the, the, while I used to win this district with 60%, um, th there have been a lot of new people moving in the district from like the Portland area, which is, you know, pretty liberal area. So some of the things have been changing here. It's not, um, uh, I, I expect a real fight. And I will say, if people want to have a liberty champion in the Maine Senate, whether you live in Maine or you live in another state where 
you've seen the work that I've done. You know, sometimes there's a domino effect across the country, like we did with the uh, constitutional carry. I'd like to see a similar domino effect with tax nullification, with defend the guard legislation. There are things I'm going to be pushing the envelope on as far as liberty issues are concerned that have national implications, uh, not just implications for the state. Uh, and certainly I would uh, ask any of your li listeners who would like to help make that happen, they could go to breakyforsenate.com and chip in because we also have something in Maine called the Maine Clean Election Act, which is not, which is like most government programs is totally the opposite of what it's named, uh, which my opponent is running under, which means she gets $70,000 from the state treasury. So from taxpayers to run her campaign. That's Only something I could. Well, anyone who wants to run as a, I would call it a welfare for politicians candidate okay. uh, and a lot and a lot do uh, all the pretty much all the Democrats do. And a lot of the Republicans do as well. Um, I've always felt like I couldn't be taken seriously if I was campaigning as a fiscal right. conservative. And the first thing I did was take seventy thousand dollars of taxpayer money right. to buy yard signs. Wouldn't be the um, best, uh, the best size signal to, to get. <laughs> No, oh, so I've never touched a dime of that money. I've always raised funds voluntarily from people who believe in the cause that I'm fighting for. And uh, even if people chip in five bucks at breakyforsenate.com, it makes a big difference. All right. Well, uh, certainly we will be following uh, your Senate ca campaign here, but I don't want to bury the lead here because there's something else you've, you've been doing in the last year or so. You have tossed your hat into the podcasting game as well uh, with your show Free America Now that, that you've been pumping out just an incredible number of episodes. So why don't you just tell everybody uh, as we wrap up here what you've been doing there with uh, Free America Now and why they should go tune in regardless of whether they're looking to support your, your Senate campaign, but hopefully they are as well. Yeah, well, I, I've been doing Free America Now. It started when I was working at Young Americans for Liberty and I've uh, took it independent when I uh, left Young Americans for Liberty to start my state Senate campaign. Truth be told, there was a long pause recently because I got so focused on the campaign, but it's up and going again now. Um, and I'm doing an episode about once a week now. Um, uh, I just had a great interview with my good friend, David Boyer, who is the guy who legalized cannabis in the state of Maine, and he's running for state legislature here himself. And uh, we recounted some of the old stories from the Ron Paul 2012 days and all the fights that have taken place for liberty uh, over the course of the last decade. But I do interviews with people all across the country in the liberty movement. We have great free range conversations about anything under the sun. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, I appreciate the opportunity to do the show and all the feedback I've gotten from people. But when I was paused the show for about a few months, uh, I heard from people. Uh, it would be like when I go to Tom Woods's wedding and people are like, what happened to your show? When are you getting going to that again? <laughs> or like, or a guy next across the river in Lewiston, Maine, who owns a bakery and is apparently like a, a listener to the show. He's like, when are you starting that again? It's been so encouraging, all the support. I'm sure you know in the podcasting world, sometimes the only feedback you get is like the numbers of how many right. people are listening. It's right. been great to it's, to it's get... putting the faces to them that changes the, the game yeah Ab absolutely so i've appreciate appreciated that uh if and and of course one of the best episodes is the conversation i had with you mark we had a I great did. conversation Always. uh last year but people can check out free america now it's on all major podcasting platforms uh and um yeah it's uh, uh it, i enjoy doing the show uh, well, Eric, uh, it's been a blast having you on. I th you mentioned it once already, but why don't you give just to, to get it through these people's heads one more time, let everybody know how they can support your campaign and feel free to plug away if you got anything else. Yeah. If you want to restore liberty in America from the bottom up, from the state level, then you can go to breakyforsenate.com and chip in five bucks, 10 bucks, 25 bucks, whatever works for you. I know it's tough economic times, but everything makes a difference. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Senator Brakey or follow my uh, campaign page on Facebook, which is just Eric Brakey for Maine Senate. All right, Eric Brakey, we will certainly be uh, keeping an eye on and, and cheering on this campaign. I think everybody could probably agree on that. So best of luck. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. All right. Thank you, Mark. Live long and live free and live free and live free and live free. And live free.